This lecture is going to focus on the Arrhenius equation, and that allows us to calculate the activation energy for a reaction. So just some kind of summary of information we know so far about rate. Um, in general, reaction rates increase with temperature. And so there's kind of a rule of thumb, it's actually amazingly accurate, that for every 10 degree increase in temperature, a reaction increases by about a factor of two. Um, that's not something you necessarily need to know, it's just kind of a curiosity. Um, regardless of whether a reaction is endothermic or exothermic, pretty much all, this is some, but pretty much all reactions need a little boost of energy. We've talked about activation energy a little bit so far, but pretty much all reactions need that little initial boost of energy. So can you think of why that might be? It is because what are we mostly doing that we know consumes energy in the very beginning of reaction? We're breaking the bonds that need to be broken, right? And breaking bonds is always endothermic. Um, but once we break the bonds, especially if it's an overall exothermic reaction, the reaction itself is going to start generating energy that can be then used to continue it. So um, on another kind of side note, since we know temperature is directly proportional to kinetic energy, um, let's think of a molecular level. Let's say that we have a container of particles in it, and these particles are reacting. So if we increase temperature, what's going to happen? They're going to start moving around faster, and as a result, there are going to be more collisions. And you may or may not remember, uh, kinetics is based on something called the collision theory, which simply says that molecules have to collide in order to react. So that's a molecular explanation of why at a higher temperature, the rate of reaction goes up, simply because there are more collisions. In addition to more frequent collisions, the collisions are going to occur with higher energy. Why is that helpful? That's helpful to overcome the initial activation energy needed. So there are really two reasons why increased temperature um, increases reaction. So this should just be a review for you. This is a reaction um, energy diagram. And of course, we always have energy in the y-axis. And um, getting the x-axis, some people don't like to think of it as time. Um, reaction progress, whatever, but typically the reactants are shown on the left and the products on the right. Um, and I, as I've said before, you need to make sure that you could sketch a diagram like this given the activation energy and either delta H or delta G. I don't want you to get confused sometimes depending what the y-axis is. If the y-axis was enthalpy, which this apparently is, um, then the difference in energy between reactants and products is delta H. You've also seen it, the y-axis is free energy, okay, G, in which case the difference in energy between reactants and products would be delta G. Um, and it's just shown two different ways, depending on the information the reader wants. So again, activation energy is difference in energy from the reactants, up to the very tippy top highest energy point and that is what determines the rate of a reaction and the delta h or delta g the difference in energy between reactants and products determines the extent of reaction another well another way we say that is it determines how spontaneous or non-spontaneous a reaction is This highest energy point at the top of the activation energy curve is called the transition state. And what that typically is on a molecular level, it's the components that are reacting with, with each other um, with the bonds 
old bonds partially broken and the new bonds partially made. And the, the reactants haven't gotten any benefit from making new bonds yet, so they're at this really high energy point. So I'm just gonna, I'm just kind of pulling an example out of my head. So transition point in this particular reaction, um, the double bond, carbon-carbon double bond um, breaks. Oops, I didn't mean to do both of them. And so sometimes it'll be shown kind of as a dashed line to show that it's disintegrating. <laughs> and um, simultaneously, a new carbon bromine bond um, is made. And then let's see, where's my eraser again? And then um, this bromine bromine bond breaks. Anyway, they're kind of just some weird, um, <laughs> and you don't need to have to do this, okay? But I'm just trying to show you, it's, it's literally in transition between um, old bonds breaking and new bonds being made. Oh, and if, um, if on the y-axis it is free energy, we say that this type of reaction where the energy of the products is lower, we call it exergonic instead of exothermic. Okay, so if it was enthalpy that we were graphing, we would say exothermic. Alrighty, so again, as I mentioned in the beginning of the PowerPoint, activation energy, abbreviated E sub A. Sometimes you'll see it like this, but I don't want you to focus on that. I'd rather have you call it E sub A. And that little initial little burst of energy that pretty much all chemical reactions require is, is due to the old bonds that are breaking. All right, you probably recognize this type of graph. I told you kinetics is loaded with graphs. This is the Boltzmann curve that we went over, I think it was unit one, yeah, in the beginning of the semester. But that plots the number of molecules on the y-axis versus um, either kinetic, either energy on the x-axis like we have here, or sometimes we've seen it as velocity or speed because they're directly proportional, okay? But in this case, it's they've got it as energy, so we'll just keep it like that. All right, so let's look what this is trying to tell us. Hopefully, you remember, or at least it'll come back to you, that this is a lower energy Boltzmann curve than the pink one. I mean, lower temperature, also lower energy. Um, and this is higher temperature. All right, because obviously, um, if you have a lower temperature, it's going to have a overall lower kinetic energy, right? Temperature and kinetic energy are directly proportional. And then as you raise the temperature, the average, or not average, the most common energy level goes to a, is higher than the most common energy level for lower temperature. And at a higher temperature, the Boltzmann curve also broadens out. So there is a wider distribution of energies the higher the temperature goes. All right, this is the area that I want to focus on, though. Let me erase this. Is this dotted line in the shaded areas. So we've talked about pretty much every reaction has an activation energy, a little initial burst of energy required to get it going. And so let's look at this particular reaction. It's just some made-up reaction, doesn't matter. At a certain temperature, at a lower temperature, what if I asked you how many molecules at this temperature for this make-believe reaction have enough energy to overcome the activation barrier? And so how would you determine that? 
Well, you would find the, the, where the activation energy is for that reaction. Make a little line here. And then you would say, okay, all the molecules that have at least this energy or higher are going to have enough energy to overcome the activation barrier. And so what happens when you go to a higher temperature and your Boltzmann curve spreads out a wider distribution of energies? So now if I were to ask you um, how many molecules have enough activation energy to react, it would now be this whole region. So the, and this is intuitive, I think. So the higher the temperature, okay, the more molecules have enough energy to overcome the activation energy. Um, so that means a faster rate, right? The more molecules you have making it over that initial hump, the faster the rate of reaction. So get familiar with the um, Boltzmann curve again and how to interpret it especially with respect to activation energy. I mentioned a couple slides ago that even very exothermic or exergonic reactions require this initial kind of burst of energy. And a, a great example of that is a com combustion reaction, burning, okay? So let's say we take natural gas, which is methane, combine it with oxygen. If you just combine these two ga gases, nothing is gonna happen until you put a little spark. And that spark provides the energy to get the combustion going. But then once it gets going, all of this energy you get when the reaction's over for molecules that have, have gone through it, um, the energy that's created can feed back in and provide new molecules the energy to get over the activation energy. So it's just kind of an initial spark. All right, so the Arrhenius equation, this is kind of interesting. I remember learning this because I remember thinking, okay, they told me that rate constant is a constant. It's clearly not. Well, it's, it's pretty much a constant unless you change temperature. So that's really the first thing I want you to know with the Arrhenius equation is that uh, rate constant does change when temperature changes. And this is a pretty complex relationship and you're not going to be using it in this form. I'm going to give you a couple other forms, but there are a couple things I want you to just think through and be able to answer. Um, so let's look at that equation mathematically. As I increase temperature, what does that do to the rate constant? Well, intuitively, hopefully, you know that when you increase temperature, the rate goes up, rate constant goes up, right? Well, now you can see it, hopefully, mathematically. As you increase the temperature, which is in the denominator of this exponent, this whole term becomes smaller, but the negative, it becomes less negative, okay? Which means that the rate constant actually goes up. So you can spend a minute with that if you want and see if you can get that to mathematically make sense. A, you can pretty much ignore. It's just a frequency factor which has to do with the particular reaction and the molecule collisions. Um, and let's see, temperature for Arrhenius equation must be in Kelvin. Oh, it's already written here. So make a note of that, okay? That's real important. And then, obviously, you can solve for activation energy if you have enough of these information. R is the gas constant. Oh, there we go, right here. And there's a particular gas constant we use any time we're talking about energy. And that value is 8.314 joules per mole times Kelvin. So... Um, the units you're going to get directly out of this equation are going to be joules, activation energy in joules, um, and you must use Kelvin. So make a note of those. I guess that's just a cleaner form of it, but I don't really have anything to add here. All right, so this is one of the forms you'll be using more. So that's just... Um, 
If you remember, if you take natural log, you can get rid of the E um, factorial thing. All right, so this is in the form of a line now. So y equals mx plus b. And so if on the y-axis you plot natural log of the rate constant, and then on the x-axis you plot 1 over temperature, remember that's got to be in Kelvin, that means that the slope you get from plotting that will be minus the activation energy divided by R. Now remember that R is 8.314. And if you ever need the frequency factor A, that is natural log of A is the intercept. But we won't, we won't be doing that. All right, so... Let's say that I have a graph and you're going to be doing this on your GoFormative, so you want to make sure this makes sense to you. The first of all, when you plot this, your slope is going to be negative. Okay, so we're going to be plotting natural log of rate constant on the y-axis, 1 over temperature on the x-axis, and the slope of this line will equal minus activation energy divided by r. So, what if I told you, what if you had the slope and I asked you what activation energy is? How would you get that? You'd simply rearrange this little equation. Um, so, you multiply both sides by r, right? By negative r. Let's do that and get rid of the negative sign. So, that means the activation energy would equal slope times negative r. It's that easy, okay? Now, the other form of the Arrhenius equation that we'll be working with is called the two-point Arrhenius equation. And that is a problem. Instead of giving you a graph, gives you two rate constants at two different temperatures. And then you just plug and chug. But believe me, uh, very easy to make silly mathematical errors. I think what usually gets me, well, there are two things that get me. One, that it's one over temperature. First of all, make sure it's Kelvin but it's one over temperature, and then you gotta subtract. And then what I really want you to pay attention to here, let me boost this up, is the um, K2, K1, T2, T1 values. So it doesn't really matter what rate constant you decide to put on top and what you decide to put on bottom, but what does matter is that you have the right rate constant with the right temperature. So K2 and T2 belong together. K1 and T1 belong together. Um, so read the question carefully. And also, the higher temperature is also going to have a higher rate constant. Remember, they're, they're related. Um, so the higher temperature is going to have the higher rate constant. So just be careful with that. All right, so I'm going to work this example for you, and then I'm also going to work a two-point example, and then you have two GoFormative questions to do, and you need to um, answer them by 1 o'clock this afternoon. All righty, so... Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, this one we got to figure out this up. Well, I'm nicer to you on GoFormative because on GoFormative, I gave you the best fit line equation so you don't actually have to calculate slope. But in this case, we have to. So here we go. We are going to pick two points on this curve just in case you have to on your final. And so we'll put it. That's a low I name. No. Let's do here. Okay. All right, so change in y over change in x, right? So this is going to be really crude because it's not, the scale isn't very precise. All right, so I'm just going to say that um, I'm going to call this y1 and this y2. So I'm going to say that y2 is minus 3.2. And I'm going to say that y1 is 2. All right, 
then change in X. So the, let's see, it's about here. And this one is, yeah, I went with this one, didn't I? Okay. So, um, so what, X1, X2, Y1, Y2. All right. So see, I'm already messing myself up. So this was y2 minus y1. All right, so I've got to do it in the same order down here, x2 minus x1. All right, so that's 0. 0.0018 is x2 minus, what are we going to call that? 0. 0.00145. All right, but it's not going to matter so much if the slope is off because I just want to show you the procedure about how you get... Um, EA. All right, so I'm just going to plug that in real quick. So on in the numerator, we have minus 5.2. And in the denominator, I have 0. 0.00045. Okie doke, let's see what that is. All right, so that slope is minus 11,556. And remember what the slope is equal to. It's equal to minus activation energy divided by R. All right. So I want activation energy, so I'm going to multiply both sides by minus R. And that will get rid of the R and the minus sign times minus r. And so now I have, let's see, m minus r is eight minus 8.314, and then minus 11,556, and that will equal activation energy. And so let's see what that's equal to. I get then the activation energy is 96,000, and by the way, activation energy is never negative, okay? It's always a positive number. 96,073, now the units are joules. But most of the time, people want you to record this answer in kilojoules. So if we did that, it would be 96 kilojoules. Alrighty, that is the graphical way. The two-point Arrhenius equation, I'm so glad I have this worked out here. Okay, the reaction itself doesn't really matter. Um, so I'm going to label these as I read it. Rate constant, I'm going to call this K1. It doesn't matter what you call it, but just to keep the Ks and the Ts that go together. Those two go together. And I'm going to call this K2 and T2. Okay, just those go together. All right, so um, they have rearranged solve for activation energy. I prefer to just kind of plug and chug, um, but however, however you want to do it is fine with me. So what I would do then, using this equation, log of K2, so that's 1.10 times 10 to the minus 5 over K1, which is 9.51 times 10 to the minus 9. All right, and equals minus activation energy, which is what we're solving for. The um, gas constant, 8.314. And let's see, and then times 1 over T2 Oh, that was nice. They gave them in Kelvin already. Okay. So 1 over 600 minus 1 over T1, which is 500. So as easy as this may look to you, please, please, please take a minute, enter in your calculator, and make sure you get this answer because there's so many different ways to goof up. And so in the next couple of PowerPoints, um, I'm not going to go through this. I'm not going to work this out for you now. 
but this is just a prompt to you. There are two go formative questions, and one of them is a graph that I want you to find activation energy for. And the second go formative question is going to use the two point equation. And that is it for this lecture.